afternoon. Um, I'm Claire Canada and I'm Deputy Director of the Centre for Global Higher Education. And um, it's with great pleasure um, that I'm chairing this seminar, which is going to take a slightly different format to um, other seminars that we hold every week. First of all, um, we've got David Willits um, as the keynote speaker. And David will speak for about three quarters of an hour. And then that will be followed by um, a contribution and a response from two other members of CG, namely James Wollstone and uh, Simon Martinson. Now, none of the speakers deserve um, an introduction, but of course, um, I will introduce them anyway. Um, David um, Lord uh, Willits is the executive uh, chair of the Resolution Foundation and he's written widely on economic and social policy. He was Minister for Universities and Science between 2010 and 2014 and of course was the architect of the current student funding system. Uh, and his experiences <coughs> as Minister uh, are the basis for the foundation of his new book, A University Education, which I'm sure he'll be referring to today. Uh, he was elected to the, uh, sorry, he was elevated to the House of Lords in 2015, and currently he is a visiting professor at King's College, London, governor of the Ditchie Foundation, chair of the British Science Fa Association, and a member of the Council of the Institute for Physical Studies, and he's an honorary fellow at Nuffield. James, who will respond um, initially to uh, David's comments, so Professor James Walsden, um, he leads on one of CG's projects about higher education engagement. He's Professor of Research Policy and Director of Research, Impact and Innovation at the Faculty of Social Science at Sheffield University. And he had very wide-ranging interests, including research policy in the UK and Europe, um, the impact agenda, and public uh, engagement in research, and evidence about the role of evidence and expertise in policy making. By contrast, Professor Simon Martinson has a very different focus, and he leads <laughs> CG's Centre for Global um, uh, Higher Education Engagement Research. He's Professor of International Higher Education here at UCL, and he is Joint Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Higher Education. And his work focuses on comparative international and global aspects of higher education, including systems and strategy and higher education and economy. So it's great pleasure that I ask David to kick off with his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Claire. And it's a uh, great pleasure to be here to talk about the themes from my book, uh, just out from Oxford University Press. You do realize, of course, that lunch was 20 pounds, but the book is free. <laughs> alongside it, I thought that's how we can market it. So I hope you find it of interest. I'm going to try to talk a little bit about the history, because I do think that the history of English higher education actually helps us understand the current structure of higher education in our country. Inevitably, then, economic returns to higher education and financing, because it's such a hot topic. A bit on research and innovation in universities as drivers of innovation, and then end up with the three big issues for the future, two of which are of international significance, globalization, and the rise of EdTech, and one which is a kind of a particular English issue around the nature of the curriculum in education. Anyway, let's start with the history, and the history, I'm afraid, is absolutely Oxford and Cambridge, which have such a powerful cultural role still in people's pictures of what the university is like. Uh, and the Oxford and Cambridge model in many ways is what has shaped our entire structure of higher education, as the following chart shows. And this, this I think, contains the clue to why our system of higher education in England 
takes the form that it does. <coughs> what it shows is that in England, in the early years, when, when universities were first being created in Western Europe, we had two universities quite early on, Oxford and then Cambridge. Uh, just as you have Bologna, probably beginning with Bologna in Italy, you have Sorbonne in Paris. And we had Cambridge in 1209. Other European countries carried on creating universities. They carried on through some, the significance of 1378 is it's the great schism where the papacy lost some power about the, on the control of uh, universities. But you can see through the middle age, later Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the Reformation, across Europe, universities kept on being created, which meant that if you are if you were a major city on the continent of Europe, you were very likely to have a university, a local university, a university of your own, by the 1700s. Uh, right, uh, that chart goes up to 1790. Apart from England, where Oxford and Cambridge exercised really quite shocking uh, powers to bar entry for other universities. Essentially, you were only licensed to teach if you had been to either Oxford or Cambridge. Recently, the University of Northampton celebrated its 10th anniversary as a university and the 750th anniversary of its, of its suppression by Oxford. But they first created a university at Northampton. So you had the exercise of multi power close links to the state to suppress the creation of other universities in England. Which meant that if you wanted to go to university, you had to go away from home and apply to a university where you had essentially nationwide access. You had two universities taking you from across the country, which is the only way to get to university. So you have a model of going away to university in a, for a, because universities are essentially a single national system. That is a different model from a localist or regional or US state model of what the universities are like. And people realized quite early on what an unusual model it was. This is a quote from the English Civil War of one of the Puritans who was actually a master of the College of Cambridge. Very presently, I said asking um, why we don't have universities in every great town or city in the nation, as in London, York, Bristol, Exeter, Norwich, and the like. Basically, he's asking for the Russell League. He's saying, why don't we have, if you get it, why is it we don't have universities elsewhere in the country? Uh, and uh, but after the Reformation, the old system carried on. And it was unsatisfactory for many of us use. And it, was a, it wasn't actually, I should make it clear, a barrier to access in terms of numbers. Because what happened with this nationwide higher education system is the way that it grew, whereas in other countries in Europe it grew by the creation of new universities, in England it grew by the creation of new colleges at Oxford and Cambridge. So they got to something like 2.5% participation by the middle of the 17th century, by the Civil War, and that was achieved by the continuous creation of new colleges. That's how you grew higher education, not by the creation of new universities. Uh, actually, the Civil War, there was a, there was a now, one of the analyses of the Civil War was that all the disruption and turbulence had been created by, guess what, too many people going to universities. So, the, uh, there was then a, you then had a decline in the rate of creation of new colleges as well. Hence the pub quiz question, which college was Oxford's newest college for longest? To which the answer is what? Created in the early 17th century, and the world was another college for around 200 years. So you have that model. Unlike the continent of Europe, and unlike Scotland, which had meanwhile got up to four universities, Adam Smith famously takes a year out from Glasgow to do a time at Balliol and records and has some fascinating discussion of this in a chapter of the Wealth of Nations as to why the educational experience at Oxford in the 18th century was so bad. What's the problem? Why is it such a poor quality teaching? To which his explanation is essentially 
you had to go to Oxford or Cambridge in order to get a senior post in the Church of England. That was part of the ways in which they policed their barrier to entry. One of the many reasons why I wasn't worth setting up another university is Oxford and Cambridge control entry to these well-paid senior positions in the Church of England. Which meant that you went to Oxford, not because you cared about the quality of teaching, but because it was a necessary precondition of then getting a post, a senior well-paid post. Um, and there is a kind of modern analogy. If the way to get your CD in front of the recruiters at McKinsey or Goldman Sachs is to have been to Oxbridge or a Russell Group University, that is a reason for applying that is independent of any teaching experience or teaching quality. And he has a fascinating discussion of that phenomenon. Um, so we have, that is the, that was the system until uh, the 19th century. And finally, in the 19th century, the duopoly is broken by the creation, and that's one of the many reasons it's great to be here at this institute, now part of UCL, and of course it was the creation of UCL uh, as a secular uh, new college in London, and alongside that, as it, it was seen as a liberal, progressive institution, the Conservatives, the Tories responded by the creation within a couple of years of King's College in London, the Tory College. Uh, so what you have is that England goes for 600 years with no new higher education institutions, and then, as every commuter will recognize, you two then come along together. <laughs> uh, and you then have the structure of the University of London put over these two to enable them to have degree awarding powers and become uh, part of the university. This opening up of the system in 1970 then, in turn, finally, to reform of Oxford and Cambridge. And for those who occasionally think that it is outrageous that politicians get involved in the business of universities, and I'm myself a believer in the autonomy of universities, but who occasionally think that um, we must inevitably make a message, yes, leave alone. It is worth recording the amount of legislation and the amount of parliamentary time that was devoted to the reform of Oxford and Cambridge through the middle of the 19th century, down to the specifics of setting up commissioners who were sent into both universities, Oxford was much less competent than Cambridge, in order to redesign, for example, the structure of professorship. Those hallowed titles, Wayne Fleet Professor of Philosophy, Chichely Professor of History, were all constructed by government commissioners sent in to access the trust funds held by individual colleges and remodel them and use them to fund new professorships designed by a government commission. That was the, um, that was the, uh, that level of government engagement in the reform of what were crucial higher education institutions. Now, I'm not going to carry on going with the history all through the 20th century, but in many ways you've already got here the outlines of something we recognize as the English system, which is a nation, an assumption that it's nationwide, a single nationwide system, that you may well be traveling away from home in order to go to university. And the big reforms of the 1960s associated with the name, name Roberts was in many ways an attempt to ensure that all English university students were endowed with things like maintenance support of the sort which you needed in order to live the life of a gentleman traveling away from home to go to Oxford and Cambridge. The assumption was that this was a nationwide system, that's the backdrop to the UCAS model. There's no entitlement of anyone to go to a local university, unlike in many US states or many parts of Europe where if you don't get above a certain mark in the school leaving exam, you have a right to go to your local university. Nothing like that. It's entirely nationwide competition for entry, nationwide applications, and, and funding for your costs if, uh, if you are living away from home. That is the model. It is in many ways what to reach the So that's, that's the history. Let me now turn to the, to the, the finances via what I, I, I think is, is something that's very important nowadays, that I read almost every day in the paper stuff about too many people going to university. The Times is saying, the Times is incidentally now, when you end the story about too many people going to university, is saying exactly what the Times said after Robbins was published, where the line again was, Robbins couldn't possibly be right, too many people going to university. 
because there's a narrative. But it's tied up with a, a, a strand of edgy skepticism. Why go? What's the point? What are the values? And universities have, I think, failed to make a clear positive case for higher education because of internal ideological disputes about which types of benefits are acceptable and which types of benefits are not acceptable. And this quadrant, which uh, we produced when I was a, a minister in Biz, is an attempt to put this in a neutral framework, saying there are individual benefits and there are social benefits. And as the second axis, there are uh, economic benefits and there are non-economic benefits. And for I, I'm not going to take you through each one of the items in each one of those quadrants, but each one of those assertions, that if you are looking for individual non-economic benefits, your longer life expectancy, better mental health, each one of those assertions is supported by empirical evidence. A lot of it, incidentally, and we should express it there here, uh, assembled by a uh, project of the Institute of Education. So every, these are not just assertions. These are, uh, uh, these are substantial evidence-based uh, reports. And you can see there are very big individual economic benefits. Also, when I was talking to the Chancellor, the then Chancellor George Osborne, about the great prize getting rid of number controls, what he was interested in, in getting rid of the Treasury, was the wider economic benefits. If you want to, if the OECD are trying to predict the long-term economic performance of a member state of the OECD, one of, one of the crucial indicators they use is the long-term path of percentage of the labour force to their university graduates. You've also, of course, got personal non-economic benefits and wider non-economic benefits. So, it has, there are many different merits. I suppose there are the ultimate purists who say you shouldn't talk about benefits at all, even thinking in a kind of consequentialist way as a, the results of going to education itself is a betrayal in principle. And I fully realise that it's inherently worthwhile in its own right. But I've never, in my experience of reading university-based research on any other aspect of our national life, found any university researchers who are happy to settle for the assertion this is just inherently worthwhile, no further scrutiny is necessary. And if university researchers take that approach to every other institution and cultural and social phenomenon of our country, I don't think we should expect higher education to be exempt from it. And these are the kind of benefits that we can find. And of course, it opens up, especially that top right hand corner, it opens up the question of how you should pay for higher education, given that it clearly does, amongst other benefits, not the sole one bring individual economic benefits. Uh, and we all know the uh, controversies, and the controversy is live again today on the, the fees and loan system that we got. I personally think that this is a rational and progressive way of financing our education. It's progressive because of this. Um, now these are raw figures, they're not causal uh, and that there's a lot of evidence that going to university is a causal factor in the rent rise and you're increasing your wages. But it shows very clearly that if you go to university, you're likely to be earning more than someone who's not gone to university. And essentially, it would be pretty odd if a market economy did like this. The more education you've got, the more human capital you've got, the more, uh, the, the more you are likely to earn. It's not to say it's the only reason for going to university clearly is a very significant economic effect and an economic benefit that the individuals enjoy. So expecting a, uh, a graduate earning £32,000 to make a contribution to the cost of their higher education, because otherwise you'll be taxing non-graduates earning on an average £22,500, seems to me to be a progressive policy. And although you may not take it from a here, perhaps you might take it from Karl Marx in, a, in his uh, uh, an essay in 1875, he puts it very well. Uh, if higher education institutions are free, that only means, in fact, defraying the cost of education of the bourgeoisie from the general tax. I think Karl Marx was correct. <laughs> they don't get to say that, so not going to say that. I think Karl Marx was uh, correct. That is what makes it a progressive policy. Uh, and it's fascinating, when you go through the, the, the history of the debate, even just in England in the past 50 years, it's clear that Robbins got very close to this. Robbins has a brief description of whether or not you should have a, a loans model or not, a uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, he, and within, a, within a year or two, 
he had come to regret that he didn't more explicitly back any fees and loans involved. Interestingly, one of his main concerns at the time of the report was that female participation would be hit. So in those were the days when there was higher levels of male participation than female participation, and he thought female participation would be deterred. Um, but he's talking already, this is within a year or two of the report, of the case for a considerable replacement of grant by loans. Now, there are many arguments for this system. I gave four, I summarized four there. Uh, first of all, this is a crucial point. It's privileged progressive. You're expecting those who, on average, are earning more to pay rather than the general majority of taxpayers who have lower earnings. It's right economically because you don't want to ration access to a university. You need some means of financing a university which does not deter people from applying because, amongst other, many other benefits, it is uh, an investment of human capital. It also solves a particularly acute problem in the English political and governmental system, which is the origins of Deering, the origins of what uh, Larry did in the mid middle of the last decade, and the origins of what this came tonight, which is when you look at claims on public expenditure and how public spending is allocated, and there are inevitably constraints on public spending, how much more you would like to spend it is not infinite. Whenever you look at it, you find that in in England, higher education loses out to many other claims. And it loses out not just to obviously powerful claims like the NHS. Within the education system, it loses out to early stage. So you can early stage education. So you can track through the 70s and 80s and 90s the unit of resource per university student falling, falling both in absolute real terms and also falling relative to the unit of resource behind a primary school student or a secondary school student and an early years student. I'm a bit of an early years skeptic, actually, and I, but I do think universities, and they're making a case for education, can learn a lot, learn a lot from the way in which the case for early years have been made. So it's, a, it's, a, it's very um, important. If we want to have well-funded higher education to find some other source of resource that does not depend on a university's minister winning an argument around the cabinet table that more resource per university student is a higher priority than building more motorways or funding the NHS or primary school education. And a succession of education ministers <coughs> from different political parties all failed to win that argument. And it's not because we weren't trying, it's because of politics is really <coughs> prioritizing. And if you do all this, if you shift the system of funding so that it is a graduate repayment system, then that also has the big prize if you take higher education out of public spending. You don't need to control public spending by controlling numbers. And in the old model, where there was a public resource per student, there was a system where for, it only disappeared finally about three years ago, four years ago, where you allocated for each university a fixed number of places. So you constrain the growth of higher education in order to constrain public spending. That's how you do it. And there's a list of, I can't remember what the UCL figure was, but for every university in England, you would be told you can recruit 3,721 students. And if you recruit 3,272, you will be fined, or there will be other penalties. And as the public expenditure pressures grew, that type of system was strengthened. And this, this system, which we had until recently, is the one they still have in Scotland, with the result that there are fewer places for students in Scotland than there are in England. And if you are controlling numbers, and you are, if the students that lose out, the people who do not get to participate, are the marginal students. I always used to have this argument with uh, my coalition partner, Vince Cable, <laughs> representing Twickenham, where I think he got a participation rate of about 65% of people under 30 in Twickenham to go to university. It happened, my constituency, which has a big council estate, much tougher area, less affluent on the south coast, uh, industrial area. We had 23% participation in higher education. I wanted more people from having to go to university. The only way more people from having to go to university was fewer people from Twickenham to go to university. We were going to have a very long wait. You needed, in other words, the best way of opening this up to get rid of number control so you have more people in total care. There's the argument this is made. Now, of course, one of the criticisms is that, that we it said, and I said, that we were going to have price competition, and it didn't happen. Why didn't we get it? We didn't get it for several reasons. The first is, given that it is a graduate repayment system and itself structured in a very progressive way, so you only pay back if you're 
Uh, you log 21,000, of course, you know that's going up to earn that's starting to pay back out of PMI if you're earning more than 25,000. Once you have such a highly progressive system, someone who said, I can't afford to go to UCL because it's 8,500, I'm going to go to King's because it's 7,500, would not be understanding the basics of the system. There is no reason when you have got a progressive, well-designed, graduate repayment system through POI, where people should be processed and a good thing too. Secondly, some people say, Andrew Adonis says, oh, but well, that shows, the fact that he's online shows us a cartel and no competition. When you go with the number controls, the competition is to win the students. The competition is who can attract the students. There is intense competition between universities for students. And then, uh, finally, I'm going to say a bit more about this, on what basis would you distinguish between the fee levels? And some people say, ah, oh, good universities should charge higher fees, and bad universities should and the years when I, through which I've worked on higher education policy, I have become less and less confident of these sublime judgments that people know what a good university is and what a bad university is. Uh, and in my discussions with Andrew Adelius in the last week, he always announces, he picks on some other ex-polytechnic every time I do a TV debate with him and tells, announces to a million people watching that London South Bank is a bad university that shouldn't be allowed to charge as much as UCL or some other one that takes on. Outrageously, with no evidence whatsoever that the teaching experience, the educational quality, uh, difference. It would be fantastic if you get such evidence, but we do not have it at the moment. Here is the, rank, the kind of ranking of universities, and I apologise that UCL does not appear, it's not an exhaustive list. Um, this is a ranking of universities, and I will reveal in a moment what it's ranking. But I would claim that this ranks universities according to what the average uh, middle class parent concerned about the quality of education of their son or daughter would have at the back of their minds as good universities versus bad universities. And the further you go down the list, the quote more likely is not to be bad. And now I'll tell you what this is actually ranking. Here's a clue. The education image. It's ranking universities by the percentage of people going to them from the less affluent and social classes. This is a ranking by the social class composition of the university. And it tells you that only 10% uh, of people at Oxford and Cambridge come from the less affluent half of the population. And as you work your way through the list, you, you find that they are taking a higher and higher percentage of people from less affluent. So the crucial feature of these quotes, bad universities, which are supposed to charge lower fees, is that they are taking more students from less affluent backgrounds. In fact, in schools, in the schools policy debate, we'd be rolling out a pupil premium for them, wouldn't we? We'd be saying that in the light of these, uh, of the fact they're taking people from a more disadvantaged background, they, maybe they should have a bit more funding if they are taking people with, uh, who bring more social uh, uh, issues with them as they go to university. So, I'm very wary of these people who say, we know what a good university is and it should be able to charge more. Uh, the good universities do, by and large, quote, good universities do, by and large, have graduates that earn more. And when John Brown proposed a levy, I'm not going to get into the complexities of what John proposed, it was an ingenious idea where you should, the higher and higher your fees went, you should have a levy. I was wary of his suggestion, but what I did was commission the excellent team of managing roles and people shepherd. To look at what the evidence was on graduate earnings, if we could find patterns of graduates from some universities earning more than others, and crucially, what the reasons were. And you do indeed find that graduates from some universities earn more than others. And the main criteria that explain the higher earnings of graduates from some universities are those from the social background of their parents, their prior attainment, and their geographical location. There's a bit of stickiness. Graduates, some graduates stand close to the university where they studied. And if you are therefore in Aberystwyth or Newcastle, your graduates tend to show up a bit less than they will think that you from UCL or King's. I don't think those are robust grounds for saying, ah, oh, those are the better universities, so they should charge more. So I'm very doubtful that there is a basis for systematically defining the good universities and the bad universities and deciding which ones therefore should be able to charge more. 
we may, and it's one of the great live issues in our education policy, we may master measurement and learning gain. We may develop metrics of teaching quality that are widely respected and trusted. And we've got to start somewhere. It's right to start that debate. But we haven't cracked it yet. If we ever were to do so, then this debate will be changed. Some people say, oh, it's a different course. We should charge more. And um, that's the kind of basis on which you might do it. And I find, in general, sometimes the very same person talking to you in the same conversation, one moment will say, we should charge more for the courses that earn more, which enable you to earn more, and then tell me, we need more STEM students. Why don't we waive the fees for the STEM students? You know, it, it doesn't matter. If you were going to do it, but if you are going to charge high fees, you'd probably put up fees for people doing STEM subjects, and is that really what many of the applicants in this want to do? I doubt it. So um, that's the background to what's now a reopened event about what we should do with the system. You can see that there are some ideas around the line of out. I don't, I'm not a believer in differential fees. If you just cut fees, and then you would be, unless you did something else to compensate, you would be essentially reducing the unit of resource behind the education of each student. That would be less money to pay for the student. We'd be back to the bad old days of overcrowded seminars and underinvestment in university buildings, there's virtually no capital investment going on in higher education in Scotland, because that's the model they've got. And it's a terrible one. So it would be, you'd have to, you'd have to out find some new public spending to compensate for loss of income from the fees. And then the question is, do you really believe, when you look at the history of public spending on higher education in England in the last 30 years, are you really confident that that is a good long-term bet for reliable, high, large amounts of public funding for education, first question. And second question, if there is public funding available for education, which would be fantastic, is that the best way of spending it? And I tell you, I have a shopping list. If, if a chancellor were ever to phone me up and say, David, I think I've got a billion for higher education, what should we do? I would not say, take a thousand pounds off fees, bring it all down to 8,000, and have an extra 1,000 uh, pounds per student in public spending. I have a list of things you could do at last tackle the part-time students issue. You could help out high-cost subjects. You could do more with maintenance. You could do a kind of pupil premium. So for any given amount of public spending that you were to promise me you're absolutely confident you could get higher education, putting it into a reduction of the fees would not be a priority. There's a graduate tax idea, but that takes you that takes you back into the old dilemmas because it's, it means that the government is once again allocating public spending, all the risks and kind of obligations that maybe we have to deliver. You can raise the repayment threshold, which helps graduates because it reduces the amount they pay back and means that essentially the generality of taxpayers would eventually pay more. But I didn't, in my experience, when I was an elected politician, I can't recall a single constituency case where a graduate came to see me to say that they couldn't afford the repayments, the 9% of PAYE, coming out being collected through PAYE above the, the threshold. Or there's the idea that somehow we need a single pot for all of tertiary education and every individual should be allocated the same amount of money, which I think is a serious uh, misunderstanding of the issues. I and mean, in a way, it's the same mistake as I make looking at Claire with the what on part time students. You have got, for full time um, three year students, a viable funding model that works. It doesn't work for other categories, it's not public spending. And it, works, but for the part-time students, the reason why we got into the different part-time students is that I thought that extending large fee loans to part-time students would help them in the same way as it did with full-time students. It didn't. In other words, you need a different model for part-time students, not the same one. We certainly need help for post-18 tertiary education outside HE and for, and for vocational routes, and that may well require some public spending, but you don't need to reduce this private resource for higher education, which doesn't count as public spending, in order to somehow find public spending to tackle these specific problems. Just get on and tackle them. You don't need to, to change the system that is broadly working in order to do that. There are things you can do. It's certainly not perfect, and there's my list, my shopping list. I think that the final loss, the last element of the recognition grant, was regrettable because it means for the first time you can say that a low-income student will leave university with a larger total amount of debt 
and so on from more of a background. I'm very uncomfortable that that principle has been breached. So you could bring back some means tested names and support. And I have to say, in all my conversations with the NUS when I was a minister, in private, I didn't have any training in problems, and I wouldn't wish to. But whether you're actually talking to the NUS, the thing that they were most focused on was the cash in hand of their members whilst they were students at university. And they were absolutely right to be focused on that. That is the pressure point. Rather than affluent graduates of the UK. You could, as I said, you part help part time as you could in the uh, So there are various things here. And I personally, politically, the most acute pressure is on the interest rate. Doesn't, it doesn't affect the, the, the repayment formula is simply nine percent above the threshold. And clearly, that's a kind of big problem. And that would be top of my political list. Now, we have, um, I think I'm going to, sadly, I'm going to have to skip very quickly through the discussion of research and innovation, uh, because I don't want to go over the full part of this I've been having. There's an awful lot one could say about this. I, I, the, the, the crucial point in the book, and there's some new evidence actually, which I will, um, which I've got in a couple of tables here, is that again, we have an unusual model. And our unusual model is a very high proportion of our R, public R&D spend being spent in the university. Essentially what we've done is had a model where we have had a relatively low level of public spend on R&D in total. And we put all our eggs in one basket. So at least the R&D spend on university-based activity matches that in other advanced Western countries, as you see about 0.4%. And what has suffered is other forms of R&D spend, our public research institutes, where we have a very thin network, which should be much uh, broader, and on other uh, and on departmental R and D commissioning of research or running their own research institutes. So essentially, universities have been that flagship that have performed well in a system that is, in other respects, been significantly degraded. That's exactly what we looked at. I'm going to have to. I will skip through these because then finally, let me just talk about these three future challenges. Um, on globalization, the first two are, are massive forces affecting many sectors of society. I personally think globalization is still at quite an early stage in universities and higher education, and we've got with Simon here, one of the great experts. If you, my view is that the proportion of, people, and I was reading in papers again the other day something about a shocking figure of several hundred British students going to study at American Ivy League universities. I mean, it reminded me of the days 30 years ago when people were shocked that someone bought a German car. Or, I mean, this is, quite rightly, an international activity. Uh, in fact, although Britain has been fantastically successful at attracting students from overseas, more than half a million a year, we've only got about 30,000 British students going to study abroad, which I think is too low. I would like to have more British people going to study abroad. I think that would be really important. And, the, and one way I would try to promote that is I would allow them to take their fee loans to fund study abroad. It would be good if we had British people who had that type of experience. As a minimum, you would make it possible to run an integrated global course. I don't know what partners UCL has, but for example, thinking of a, an Australian example, the University of Warwick is linked to Monash, and they had a program, they designed a program where they come, they converged significantly closely, that you could have done a maths course or a physics course or a history course, which was one year at Warwick and one year at Monash. And what did they find? The model collapsed because there's no way the English system permitted a fee loan to fund the Warwick student for their year at Monash. These are what in the old days, we believe we put non-tariff barriers to trade. It should be possible to do that kind of thing. So we should embrace globalization. I think it's, it's going to happen. Brexit is, of course, a massive challenge. I think that Brexit may have a paradoxical effect, however, of encouraging more British universities to have a more substantial presence on the continent of Europe in order to be confident they can continue to participate in EU research. <coughs> and that can't just be a postponement of the checks coming back to the UK. That will have to be real research activity located in campuses or partner institutions on the continent. And one way of getting out there responds to that learn. 
That's the first change. Then the second leader, of course, is education technology. Some of you will be familiar with this classic image um, of how education has been delivered over the centuries. This is Bologna from about 1300. Interestingly, just as one relevant to the previous discussion, we know that the lecturer was Henry of Germany. We know that this is a case study in international education, and Bologna took students from across Europe, indeed, um, there's one very attractive theory that the first use of the word nation to capture people born in a particular territory, the first widespread use of it was nations as they were represented within the student community in medieval universities. So they were taking students from abroad. That is, um, that format, I have to say, is not massively different from this, is it? <coughs> 700 years later. And it is just possible that now we are going to have some change. And I'm, I'm one of the people who do think that we're going to have more change. I think it's a good thing. Uh, and uh, it's not just online teaching methods. It's also big data. It's the rise of, of the use of large data sets to understand close up how people are, are what kind of education experience they have on the board of the Crick, which the UCL is a part of just up the road. We had one image at the Crick of some of the research we were doing on the DNA structures of cells. And the little footnote here said so this is based on 210 million data points. So it would be nice if when we're discussing what works in something just as important as education, we also had access to 200 million data points. And we're not far off it. When you are engaged in the online learning, Every keystroke can be analysed, and people can see that this question led to the following mistake shared by 17% of people in the programme. This question took 7% longer to answer than the previous ones. They went off track in the following way. We will at last get proper empirical evidence about how people are learning, and course by course, programme by programme, and I do think this will transform uh, education. Uh, and a good thing. Um, I think for universities the challenge is whether, as I put it in there, this slide, they are disintermediated or disintermediated. One of the great things the digital education does is it weakens the position of the intermediate. So far, if anything, it's rather helped universities. Those agents that universities have become too dependent on for recruiting overseas students, now there's a much greater chance that someone overseas will be able to get some kind of experience of what the education is like at the university by testing some of their online programs and online courses. Uh, so some of the recruiting processes are actually being disintermediated by technology change. But of course, and it's, there's, a, there's a threat as well, because the university, what really makes university a university leader is the, the power to award its own degrees, which in turn are very important signals of people's human capital. If that starts getting disintermediated, and you can post some kind of results from your online course and stick it straight into your LinkedIn profile, and that's what an employer needs in order to decide to recruit uh, you. You may find that the university degree itself declines in significance in the labour market and is challenged by other more powerful and effective signaling devices. So I think there is a disintermediation challenge to the university as well. And then my, my, final, um, my final chapter of the book is really about a particular issue, not these big global trends, but a particular issue, which is early specialisation. And early specialisation, where if you look at it, universities have played a crucial role in driving school specialisation. It goes right back to where I started. When you have competitive entry to university, the schools have to do and the students have to study the subjects and in the way that the universities are recruiting. To get an Oxford scholarship, you apply in a particular course. You have to focus your expertise in a particular area to get in. The A-levels originally were emanations of universities. They were shaped by the universities. And particularly by the university departments who wanted the sense that you had already some mastery of the subject, or at least some familiarity with it, before they selected you to go to university to do a particular subject. Completely different from the American model, where the most widespread single course specified in university admission applications in the US is undeclared, not yet decided. 
Imagine what the English model of higher education would be like if most applicants to universities were undeclared. One of the first things it would do, incidentally, it would create massive internal competition within universities in the first year, in the way that you lectured and educated, so as to attract these undecided students to study your subject. So you create a completely different dynamic. You start off with generalists and you try by the way you educate them to put them over to yourself. So I think you have a beginning. Well, I've tried to review some of the issues in the book. We're now going to have two expert commentators, and I'm very much looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Some of the more sophisticated criticisms of that funding model, 
such as those offered by Andrew and Gethin and others, uh, as other commentators have said on the book. But, you know, parking that for the moment, leaving you for the questions, I think it's important to say to those who haven't yet read it, the book is far, far more than an elaborate defence of uh, the choices David took in government. Uh, its breadth, in its uh, historical sweep, and its scholarship, some of which has come across in David's remarks uh, here today. Uh, it's a genuinely impressive contribution to higher education studies, to research and innovation policy, uh, and to politics and around. Uh, I think Simon will touch on, on some of these aspects in, in his remarks. We should also credit David with his willingness to acknowledge uh, mistakes that he made or things that he can now do differently um, over part-time students, which he's mentioned, uh, applied research, uh, the design of the ref, to give three examples. Um, he's also notably guarded at various points in the book in his support for certain aspects of the TEF and the Higher Education Research Act that uh, um, have been uh, pursued by, uh, by his successors. In many respects, I think the most significant arguments of the book are those that they've made to the end that you touched on just now around uh, the secondary education system, around the need to broaden uh, um, and avoid premature specialisation um, at A level or earlier. And kids going through that process now, I, uh, that, that chapter resonated very strongly with me. Um, and for me, as someone who, in my own work, is primarily focused on the research side of the system. Um, I found his, his discussion of those issues, the, the, the two chapters in particular, related to research and to innovation, uh, particularly thoughtful. Uh, there's a huge amount I agree with here in the uh, uh, analysis he offers, uh, and I didn't have time to, to fully talk through that just now. Um, but, but some really valuable stuff in there, and, and I think a, a very important contribution to our understanding of both the specifics of the UK system and the comparative. Uh, strengths and weaknesses of that system set against uh, others. Um, so, not to take too much time, I'm obviously breaking to have a wider discussion, but let me just close with some three questions to David uh, that uh, he might perhaps pick up in the discussion, uh, and, and, and which will hopefully help to, to, to stimulate others. Um, first, inevitably, on in light of the current politics of HG funding, uh, and uh, points that he's touched on already, how confident in a sense is he that the model will survive? Uh, what does he think the major review, which now we await with interest, will uh, achieve, will do in terms of the list of points you made there in one of your slides at the end? Um, second, and a more wonky question related to research, uh, as I said, I agree with, with pretty much everything David argues on this, but there's also a striking perhaps somewhat contradictory move that he makes in, in the, the, the chapter four on research in setting out a very thoughtful critique of, of, sort of lack of diversity in the UK research system in terms of where research takes place, uh, as, 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 as he touched on again now, the fact that, uh, as I said, we put all our eggs in one basket, that, that basket being the university system. Um, he ends that chapter with a, a pretty robust defense of UKRI uh, uh, as a solution to, to um, better you know, optimising the performance of that system. And of course, David is now on the board of UKI. Um, despite the fact that, of course, that is a single institutional basket, not, not where the research is taking place, but where the research system is being organised. And uh, I don't want to reopen all the debates about the, the, the AG bill, which you know, we discuss on, on other occasions, and I also agree with David that there is a persuasive case to be made for the strategic coordination that UKRI will bring to the system, particularly in light of Brexit and other turbulence that now confronts uh, research. Um, but I am at the same time very interested in how David thinks diversity, which he clearly recognises as a very important determinant of dynamism and success, can be effectively preserved through that reorganised system. Uh, you know, sitting as we are now, ten weeks away from the, the formal launch of uh, uh, that new era, um, and in particular within that, how structures like UKRI can best address questions of balance in the system. I mean, both balance 
the institution, as you've, as you've described, in terms of where research takes place, balance between the different modes of funding, research council, QR, uh, and, and, and other forms, uh, balance across disciplines, um, the, the power of the biomedical uh, uh, community and the funding system, which is something you, you, you don't really tackle. I mean, we'll talk about the quick at the end. But all of these are issues that will be sitting, burning a hole in what's in the I'm just so interested in your reflections a few months on from here on, on, on how that will work. Uh, and a final very quick question. Um, has Sam Yima read the book? Uh, and what advice would you point him towards uh, from the book as he gets up to speed with his new brief? Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much, David, and thank you, James. Um, and um, this is an important book and should be read by everyone here. Uh, I think Oxford University Press have done an excellent job in unequivocally providing a large-scale, uh, wide-ranging argument across history and across the present and in particular by providing a picture of the UK higher education system in the present from the po a point of view which I call critical liberalism, which is one of the great strengths of that tradition. So I think David's book embodies the strengths of higher education in its own way, but also discusses those strengths and makes a critical evaluation of how they could be further advanced. It's an, it's an important statement that draws on philosophy, history, economics, sociology, higher education, uh, a recent and careful and constructive discussion of science and research, and I agree with what James has said about that. And it, it reflects a close knowledge of the UK and a, and a, and, and a well-informed knowledge of the United States higher education as well. And I think to some extent Europe and Germany in particular get uh, some, some attention in the book. It doesn't range much further than that. Um, globally, but except to say that the rest of the world is important too. Um, the, I mean, there, there's, there's two strands though in the book, and this, I'll come back to this a bit in my remarks. I mean, one is that it's a commentary on current issues and immediate issues. It takes us very close to the present, actually, and in that sense, you've done very well, I think, to, to, to sustain the immediate readability of the book in, in the light of current political debate. It also has a long term and larger intellectual importance and agenda. Um, as a statement about universities, about British universities in particular, and about the, the, the animating ideas and, uh, and social practices that have created the role of higher education in the world. And it's that aspect that I particularly want to focus on. Um, there are a lot of things I like about this. One, one, one is that I think your, your handling of the literature is very sure. I, I really felt very comfortable about that all the way through, and also your handling of the data. Um, and they're pretty significant strengths, not often in the same place. Um, the second one is the historical sweep, which the historians here, like Mike Shadok, I think, will appreciate particularly. I mean, the way in which um, you've, uh, you, you've taken us from the medieval university on very successfully through that whole sequence of development. I mean, I'm, I, as a, an Australian, I'm still learning about the history of British higher education. I'm fascinated to, to find that Oxford and Cambridge actually blocked the formation of every other possible yes. university for 600 years. I mean, that's, that's very interesting to me. Um, what, what an extraordinary thing. But what I particularly like was the way you brought um, the discussion of the German contribution and Kant and you know, the, 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 great, the great essay on the Enlightenment, that, that crucial moment, uh, the importance of that, and you take us through the 19th century, the importance of the, the German contribution to the to creating the research university and the American university in particular. And, to the, and then, of course, it runs into the law so terribly in 1933 <coughs> in, in Freiburg when Heidegger, as the rector, stands up and embraces Nazism, you know, the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, the most important intellectual, arguably, of the century, embraces the most terrible state that's ever been created. And isn't the issue of university autonomy important? I mean, isn't it? And, and that's within the lifetime of some people. Um, it's not that far away from us. And so, and the German university is only now recovering its potential and its role in the world since that terrible moment. Um, so those are the sort of things you get from David's book. Um, I mean, you also get anecdotes and, and, and stories and an engagement with the sector in the UK now, which is um, fresh and fun. Um, and I particularly like uh, the, the George Bush anecdote. I mean, George Bush is, um, 
uh, is uh, at the commencement, at the graduation um, ceremony at Yale in 2001 at his old university, and he says, "To those of you who received honours, awards, and distinctions, I say, well done. And to the C students, I say." You too can be president of the United States. <laughs> it's, it's things like that which I think keep the reader going and uh, right through the book. Um, now, let me say that I think David's contribution, though, in longer term, goes beyond what he said about the contemporary policy environment and, 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 and even such important things as the fees and loan system. Um, his, 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 his advance of a, with the quadrant diagram and the text that surrounds it, of a broad view of what universities and other higher education institutions do beyond the immediate employability of graduates or their rate of pay. Um, he goes to a much larger picture about their social and individual contribution. His um, humanist, generous approach to the formative role of universities, the way in which he talks about the way they build confidence and capability, the capacity to learn and so on throughout life. I mean, they're words which we bandy about, but David gives this discussion flesh and form, and he draws on a range of literature and does this in a way which I think is a fundamental challenge to the narrow way in which higher education and the potential of the public contribution to higher education particularly is understood. I mean, there are, th there are propositions arising from David's argument which are very important policy propositions which aren't currently part of the discussion but should be. For example, his, his, his evidence support for a four-year first degree, um, the, importance, the, the, the important potential that that would offer. Um, his, his thoughts about broadening um, from, from the current narrow early specialisation, which is a, a, a principal problem in the UK system, although, of course, it, as he says, it's also an intellectual strength. But it is a problem, and he seeks to embrace the strength and overcome the problem by changing the structure of schooling so that, um, that in the sixth form you, everyone does maths, everyone does an art subject. There is that, that embracing of the two cultures. I mean, these are really important long-term difficult issues which David, I think, is, 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 is almost alone at the moment in the political space in advancing some in-depth thinking about. Um, the, I mean, he, he clearly thinks employability is important. He also says that it's more than an employability. I mean, I think that's a very important perspective. I also like, there are a lot of little things. Like, I like the way you, David's refashioned the STEM debate. And he said that, um, well, maybe the demand for STEM is somewhat overstated, and it's about the world we'd like to see rather than the world we actually experience. If there was, if there was a, a general shortage of STEM skills, then that would be showing itself in the labour market by in the wage structure and so on. And I think that's very true, because I, I, I was part of a project which looked at STEM in 24 countries, and that's the conclusion which the better researchers were reaching in most countries. But also, David's right to say that we don't have enough engineers, and, he is, and, and that is partly related to the early specialisation problem, the, the fact that not enough people do physics and so on, and his, and his proposals about the restructuring of upper schooling um, will address that crucial problem of not enough engineers, um, and the way in which we frame it so that too many people are trying to get into medicine, not enough people are trying to get into engineering, and the kind of perverse effects that, that all of that creates. So those, is, those issues are little gems, I think, in the book. And, and I generally agree with his handling of globalisation, and I think that his um, generous position in relation to the Home Office, in relation to immigration, regulation, and opening up uh, the border, um, and, uh, and encouraging the growth of the export industry, um, you know, is, is, un is unequivocally correct. Where I have my disagreements in, I suppose what you'd expect in a, in, a, in, a, in a liberal social democratic critique of a, of a classical liberal position. That is, I, I think that um, openness in markets is not the same as openness in relation to the knowledge flows or the flows of people across borders. They're, they're somewhat different problems and markets don't necessarily deliver the benefits which I think David and many others in the political sphere hope that they will deliver. Um, in particular, uh, we, uh, we find that by opening up um, the system to new providers, which I think is, it's impossible to disagree with the, the notion of, of creating greater diversity in the system. Um, but, I mean, by doing so, we don't necessarily pose any change to the position of the established providers. That the, the new providers are in a segment of the market where they do address some needs which aren't being met by the current system. But, they don't, but, but by creating that form of challenge, you don't necessarily change the position of those uh, institutions with strong positional advantages, established social and intellectual capacity.
cultural capital, reputational capital, um, nor do you, uh, in relation to universities which are oversubscribed, which have large numbers of people outside the gate, necessarily create um, any kind of consumer power by, by, within, from the price system, nor do you do so, uh, do so um, by, uh, by the choice mechanism. Because when an institution has many people queuing outside the gate, the choice mechanism doesn't have much bite. Um, so, you, so only naming and shaming through th things like um, the emphasis on teaching and, and, um, um, can, 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 can impact the, the position and reputational position of, of those leading institutions. I mean, I, I've reached the conclusion that you know, it's, it's perversely different to the, to, to the, the market assumption um, that um, when you look at the world, world's higher education systems, you get diversity where it exists primarily through government action or in the United States through, um, through the use of a classification system, which is almost in civil society, it's not really regulated by government. Governments also, are, as we know, capable of creating great homogeneity and removing diversity. Um, but it's in those systems where you've got binary set sectors, where you've got a number of different kinds of institution, um, in, as in the United States, it's in those systems that you see a flourishing diversity where you create a, a, a uniform market where everyone's essentially contending for the same research university um, status and role, you, you end up uh, creating um, some very strong institutions at the, at the top and a whole lot of pale limitations of those institutions further down arranged in a steeply hierarchical ladder. That doesn't create diversity and suppresses it. So the competitive mechanism doesn't have the kind of positive effects that it has in the retail sector. So I mean, but, but these are long-standing discussions and, 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 and disagreements, I know. Um, I also thought maybe David, you could have said more about inequality. I was really shocked by the um, excellent data you provided on um, regional inequality. You know, when you see the position of the North and Midlands, you, you really worry. You know, when you see the, the, the differences between um, uh, position in, in, those, in those parts of the country and the South <coughs> and London and. Um, Maybe we, sh we it's so easy to say it's too hard for us to tackle this. I mean, I, I think that higher education is probably not the primary driver of, of you know, social and economic inequality in the world, but it certainly has a role. And maybe more energy and, 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 and needs to be put into the effort to try and find a, pos a positive relationship between what we can do and addressing the inequality. So I thought maybe that was an area you could have expanded on. Um, but look, it's a great book, and I think there's a greater book inside um, I, you know, this, is, this, is, this is a book which is so much about the contemporary political environment, um, still. If you, if you were able to take out the discussion of contemporary issues and what you were able to do as minister and could just consider what the book is saying about the evolution and nature of higher education, it, its strengths and weaknesses, where it fits in with the economy and the society, its role in terms of modernity, um, you may not get as many readers and you may not get as many people in this room, but in 20 years you have more impact. Um, so I think there's another book which I hope you will write, which builds on, which builds on this one um, and, and it has that kind of Clark Kerr, you know, sort of long term effect. I believe you can do that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon and James. I'd now like to open the floor. Do you want to start off by responding to Simon and James's comments, or do you want to just take questions from the floor? Well, they're both very generous. I think we should give the people the floor. Okay, fine. Right. So there are two lovely friends. There are two people with broken mics. Can I ask you to please um, introduce yourself uh, when you uh, respond? So, Ariane, there's somebody at the front here. Uh, been away through. Thank you. And do you want to keep the time? Yeah. yeah. I will take you over time. And then the gentleman over there. And then at the front here. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sam. Um, I am not an expert in this field, but I want to be. Uh, but I just have a very strong interest. Um, especially Simon's last point. I, I, if you write that book, that book within the book. That's the dream book that we're looking for, right? That's, that's the thing I'm really interested in. I think that's an important issue. And as you said, Simon, the ability to have um, something that would have an impact that would last 20 years is something which is kind of lacking and potentially the university system suppresses. Some of those kind of longer term impacts, that's not. Um, sorry, not to brag. Um, my question would be um, 
is there a role, what, okay, what do you think the role is for universities in you know, supporting Michael now? You know, there's, the, there's the idea that you know, the university is based on the young, this is that, that's it, um, and that actually you know, people need university education throughout their lives at different points, at different points in their lives, they're ready for it, and they should be able to access it as and when they need it. Um, what are your views on that? Thanks. Okay. Well, Hi, um, my name is Alan Standish. I'm the um, subject leader for Geography um, and Strategic Education here at the Institute of Education. Um, my question um, to David is uh, just, if I can answer, please. Um, it's probably, I'm sure it's probably in the book, which um, I haven't had a chance to read yet. Um, but an answer to the question that's posed here today, which is what is a university education? Um, what is a university education? I mean, we've talked a lot around that question, maybe, and um, Assignments to move into slightly, but I think, um, uh, and I raise it because I think it's, I think it's probably the most important question our um, university faces today. Um, I think, um, you know, some of your earlier points you said about uh, purists versus you have your, your table with the four uh, sections where you talk about the, the benefits of the university in extrinsic terms, um, and yes, you'll set your foot in the Camp of being purists is saying, well, I think we need to value value our university and knowledge I mean, for their own sake. And I'm not denying that those extrinsic benefits are definitely there and very important. But I mean, two reasons why we need a really strong answer to what the university education is today. Um, one, that, if, that we, we are increasingly justifying education both in schools and universities in, uh, as, a, as a means to ends, not an ends in and of itself. And when you do that, you actually devalue the education itself. Okay, you turn it into something else. If you treat it as an instrument, you turn it into the road, the thing itself, because you're, you're actually uh, changing, you're slightly you know, corrupting uh, what it is you're trying to achieve. Uh, but secondly, young people and children today increasingly are, 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 have been schooled into viewing education in that instrumental way. They, they don't see it, they, they're not being taught that education is, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, Kind of maybe overrating it for a little bit, but it, in lots of schools I see, uh, you know, I see uh, children being taught that it's it's hoops to jump through, and that it's a, it's a way to you know social mobility, it's tolerance, it's all these things, but they're not being taught to, to love you know learning for its own sake, and, immer and the value of immersing themselves in knowledge, um, which is would mean that they would really understand why they're going off to university. So I think I think it's a really important question to ask. Yeah, thank you. Hello, Professor. I'm in that um, class of creating university Oxford that we've heard about. Uh, <laughs> yeah. as in Boone. Um, I think this is probably a question that relates to the book within the book, which is that, um, as we know, universities are private institutions, but often considered in the uh, national debate, the public, we've seen all the legislation, all the, 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 the interventions, the political interventions, the um, recent debate about vice chancellor's salaries. But as direct grant funding from government has significantly been reduced, um, there's a, perhaps a, a move to them being more able to operate as private institutions and make more choices. And yet, would we like what universities were like if they behave like that? How do we square the circle between enabling them to take some of the opportunities and freedom to the creative and still then delivering what we as society expect from universities and what universities. Right, yeah, I mean I think um, on Sam's question, the I think my point of view is, is my my kind of personal view uh, of what this work is I do think that the the transition to adulthood, that the university and that I've been the university is the modern form of managed transition to adulthood, displacing apprenticeships and military service, which are two other classic forms. And I, I think as I look forward, I would expect countries like Britain and the modern global societies to be increasingly technical, going away to universities in that transition. Uh, for mature students and adult learning, I'm sitting next to the experts, but I think there the arguments are very different. And if you've already got a job, living with a partner, perhaps having kids, the whole idea we've got this brilliant idea of 
they suggest we've got to be like, why don't you spend two years away from all these in some other institution where you will have us sort of be treated as a sort of semi three quarters adult? Isn't at all what you want. And that's where I think the online, I, I do think that the online education is going to have its biggest role. Uh, and it's with the future here at the university, it's the future of many other organizations trying to deliver that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and indeed, I'm an advisor to American company, to you, which is absolutely specializes in this area. We have master's courses delivered for American universities in the online web. So I think it will be different. And something else that I probably didn't do enough of as a minister of this thing. I remember going back and urging our universities to create something like Future Learn, so for 70 but I think it is, it's clear to me that that, that, that ed tech is particularly important at the moment. On the second question, kind of, um, what is a, well, what is a university? I, I, I try various definitions inside others in the book. I mean, a university education, higher education is a type of education. The university is a type of institution. Higher education is education at the frontiers of knowledge. And that means either it's, uh, its research or the education itself is informed by what's happening in front of its knowledge and uh, takes students towards them. The university is a type of education institution. We have higher education outside the institution. The university is a type of institution where the distinctive features are perhaps with all the same degrees. And that is a, a crucial, um, it's not completely neat and tidy, that's how I say what, what sets them apart. Um, they are wonderful places in there. Uh, but I, don't, I just don't think, and, and I, I, again, I say in the book, I, you could write page after page of kind of servo shotty and poetry about these wonderful places where there is a, um, one, and they are one of the best guarantors of freedom that we've got. They provide an environment where people should be able to speak and think and argue freely. Um, but the trying to investigate what they do and how they do it and what the consequences are seems to be absolutely the kind of endeavour which, as I said in my remarks, or what universities themselves represent. Surely if it's not an astringent, questioning, challenging intellect, what, how does this institution work and what are its effects? Universities above all should be places that understand that that is, incorrect. That is how almost every practice and institution in modern society is now considered. Um, and my view is that universities have been, uh, because they've got, argue, got into an argument about economic effects versus others, they haven't fully uh, in great engaged with that. And although people think it's my generation of politicians who are the appalling the kind of utilitarians and all this, I do, I, do, I do quote Robbins quoting Confucius. So <laughs> talking about taking steps back. And you see, Robbins himself didn't, he only made the point by attributing it to Confucius. But this is what Robbins quotes Confucius as saying. They are now quoting Robbins. Confucius, because that interest, interest, I wasn't able to find the exact quote in the Atlas. <laughs> Confucius said in the Atlas that it was not easy to find a man who had studied for three years without any at pay. That's not, that's not a Thatcher, right? That's not me, though. That is Robin's report citing Confucius. So this line of argument that one of the purposes of a university is to, you spend three years in order to have something that commands value in the labor market, is not some appalling modern abomination. They go back to Confucius. Um, and I don't think we should be shocked by that. And indeed, more than half of university students are doing a vocational course. One of my frustrations, actually, is that so many people think that universities are quotes for academic education, therefore if you want to strengthen Britain's performance in technical education education, you come outside universities. A lot of it happens in universities, and it's the digital role of universities. Then, Heaven's question about um, public or private institutions. Yes. Um, I don't know what you're, what you're thinking of that they might do. If anything, my anxieties at the moment on the opposite, I think it's really important that universities are not part of the public sector. And I think we're in, and I think that's a, um, a guarantor of their freedoms and also their flexibilities. And, um, and although, of course, universities have a public value and a public role, 
I always used to say to my critics, you know, is, are you going to take this so far you actually like to be in the public sector? Let's be are you saying you think universities should be in the public sector? So that all their borrowing goes <coughs> towards the public sector borrowing, and all their pay rates are like, you know, determined as part of the public sector pay. Do you really want it? And everybody, I have not yet, and maybe there's someone in the audience, I've not yet found someone who is so committed to the public value of universities, they say, yes, please can we enter the public sector. So I think it's really important that they're outside the public sector. And my view is a drift of treating them as if they're within the public sector. Um, and I think that was that's why Andrew Adonis's campaign on Vice Chancellor's Pay, I thought, had a real risk. I thought the, the danger was the solution was worse than the problem. Of course, there was an issue about some of the leaders might talk about. But if we end up with the public sector, the public sector pay rules applying to universities, I thought that would be a bit back into the old French model. Um, so I don't quite know what are these dangerous things that they might do, but in the old days the power of Hefke was certainly a constraint on these kind of things, and in the new world the power of the OFS. So if there were an egregious and appalling thing that uh, the university was doing, there are, there is in reality a regulatory framework that I think would be a constraint, then my worry is that they're going to be too constrained. Okay, so for uh, sorry, Peter, I beg Peter, for <laughs> um, and so. This is just a brief comment on the, the, the Scottish imbalance. Sorry, I'm brief start from here. Um, a brief comment on the English Scottish imbalance, which in itself is probably not very interesting. It's often used as a proxy for asserting the superiority of a kind of higher fee market based system. There were no fee uh, publicly balanced system. Um, I think I heard you say, David, that England had a higher participation rate than Scotland. I don't think the data supports you. The current HEI PR in England is 49% and in Scotland is 56%. So there are people in Scotland who go to higher education who wouldn't go to higher education in England. Their peers wouldn't go in England. Um, Secondly, though, you didn't say it today, um, but it's in the book, um, it's often again argued that somehow England has been more successful in uh, uh, producing fairer access than Scotland. Um, and that, the data that's used to support that is a university to university comparison. That's actually highly misleading because in the case of Scotland, a very substantial number of students don't go, go to higher education, they go to university, they go to colleges, they do higher nationals. Suddenly, which has almost died out here at the private, in the private for profit sector. Um, uh, so, actually, you're, you're not, by definition, Scottish universities are more exclusive than England because they don't enroll such a high proportion of the population. There's a second factor, of course, Scotland has a much higher proportion of students in pre 92 universities. And in post nineties to universities in England. So of course if you do a university to university comparison to England and Scotland, mm -hmm. it looks good from England's point of view. If you look at a higher education to higher education comparison, you actually get rather the different result. Now, I'm not going to argue it's an interesting debate I think to have about whether a market based system is actually fairer in some way than a kind of publicly planned system. Uh, all I'm saying is I don't think the English Scottish comparison actually supports that uh, conclusion at the moment. If anything, it tends to support the opposite conclusion. Thank you. 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 I'm Paul Ashman from the Centre for Global Higher Education from Lancaster University. Um, th thank you for a very engaging and challenging um, discussion. Um, one of the things that concerns me, I think, is that we're getting into a bit of dichotomous thinking here. So either education is about transformation or it's about to drop. And actually those things aren't either of us. And in research we've done, actually while students might go looking for a job, yeah. what defines the quality of that experience is being transformed by knowledge and being open to changing their sense of who they are and what the world is. And in your sort of four quadrants, one of the dangers of those quadrants is that you have individual and wider, and you have economic and non-economic. And essentially, two of those are non-categories. So you have individuals and everything else, economic and everything else. And I think the dangers of those categories 
is that they always bring us back to individuals and economics because everything else is everything else. And so I wonder whether they act as a barrier to us thinking about education's role in relation to society and in relation to the transformational effect they have on people's lives. And whether, if we thought about it in those terms, that would more naturally lead to considerations of equality and inclusion within society and the roles that universities play in that. Hi, I'm Ella Bailey, a senior teaching fellow at UCL in physics. Um, my question is for uh, Davis. Um, your main justification for stretching D seems to be that uh, people not going to university shouldn't be subsidising the fees that people who are benefiting personally from that tuition. Um, wouldn't another option be to um, provide training of equal cost? and equal um, uh, benefits to people who are not going to university and to make the training or tuition free for everyone. Right. Um, I mean, there is quite an early debate about in this uh, Scottish <coughs> comparison. And uh, uh, I know it's... it's uh, I, I personally do find a sort of Scottish assumption of moral superiority very tough. <laughs> as I hint in the book. Um, a lot of this argument depends on the value you attach to the non-university HE option in Scotland. And one response to your life argument, I just have to observe watching the exchanges of this, is of course that the non-university HE option in Scotland has relatively poor outcomes for the students. <coughs> And when you do look at the university option, which is clearly the route into uh, well-paid jobs and the um, high prestige jobs in Scotland, access to university in Scotland has a lower social mix than access to university in um, England. But the England v Scotland debate will run and run and run. And I don't regard, uh, uh, and indeed one of the things, and I think sensitive to some of these charges, I think one of the things they're trying to do in Scotland actually improve the routes out of higher edu colleges delivering higher education into university, which I take is even Scottish government accepting that they are vulnerable to that kind of problem. Um, Paul, I, I thought it was a really, that was a very fair point. I think it's a, um, and I can remember, I mean, in the course of writing the book, you know, there's the minutes, I remember a, a fantastic guy, conversation with a guy who was studying journalism. He said, I started studying journalism at university because I wanted to be a journalist. Um, but as a result of studying journalism, I got so much more interested in what's happening in the wider world. It has changed my view of the world in a way I didn't expect. I just thought, I was going to train to be a journalist. So you're absolutely right. And um, you need to organize the material somewhere. And the quadrants are organized in that way, partly because of so much of the focus, which I have been on receiving over the years, who only ever talk economics. What about the rest? Um, but there is an interdependence between them, I accept that. Uh, on the fees, well, let's think through what your proposal would be. Um, you would first, and, and there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a school of ideas, there's a net of ideas, there's a, there's a sort of subset of ideas on this kind of sort of around at the moment. Just give everybody a fixed pot of money. Now, I think there are several different One question, first of all, is, is this pot of money public spending <coughs> or not public spending? Uh, I think for many of and you've got, and either way, you encounter a problem. You could say it's public spending. It's, well, it's a good use of public money, and we should um, spend, we should just have a public expenditure commitment for every 18-year-old to have £25,000 <coughs> worth of public spending on their education in their life. That is a massive new public expenditure program, and I fear that you would, it, I, I don't have any reason to hope it will be more protected from all the pressures to put the money into the NHS during this winter crisis or whatever that we've seen historically in, in the past. Um, alternatively, we repeat the mechanism we've got in higher education, because in higher education we have found a successful way of funding it that is not a barrier to entry, that 
is progressive and it doesn't require public spending, the graduate repayment model. So you say, we've got a repayment model. We'll give everyone an entitlement to an education loan. And this is why my uh, painful experience with part-time loans is relevant. The loans model does work for higher education for undergraduates. It clearly didn't work for part-time loans. A lesson from my part-time loans mistake is it that you need horses for courses. The lesson is that a single model applied to everyone does not function. So I think actually, although it's not as tidy-minded as your solution, the realistic one is to say, wherever are areas where the premium, the labor market premium is clearly substantial as it is on average for graduates, and you can reasonably go for a repayment model, you do that. In other areas where the, repay, the loans and repayment model did not work, and we tried it for post-24 education, we were going to have loans to do A-levels, we were going to have loans to do level three courses, and the take-up was, was catastrophic, and the Treasury didn't like them because the ramp charge was very high, the repayment prospects were poor. In areas where you can't make a graduate repayment model work, that's where the priority, that's the priority use of public spending. And indeed, one of the advantages of having shifted some of this out of public spending is that it should release public spending to be spent in the areas which do require public spending. So, although that is less tidy minded than we're going to give everyone 25,000. In your model, why do I have to give 25,000 to someone doing law at Oxford who's on their way? do an incredibly well paid job. Or, if you say we're going to give everybody a loan of 25,000, you have to give loans to people for who, who are uh, averse to taking out a loan, like part-time students. So either way, I think your system, however, and as I say, it's got a, you caught the, as you caught the zeitgeist. You are the current hot proposal, and it's actually close up, I don't think it's as effective as loans for students, public spending, for other groups for whom that's not suitable. Okay, I have a question. William, and then in the middle, and then at the back, on the back row, last person. I'm really not the current director of the higher education. Um, David, we had a to do with each other when you were at Minister of the FD, but I think the last time we were in this room together, and with Blair, and with Peter Scott and Michael Chattuck, was the 50th anniversary of the Robins before the conference we held here. And I was very impressed, we were all impressed that you not only came and gave your speech as a minister at the start of the day, but you stayed the whole of the morning and lunch, and debated with people for several hours. Uh, I can't actually imagine. Um, another higher education minister doing that. Uh, I've observed over many years another higher education minister doing that. Um, so thanks for that. Um, it's never surprised me, but it is often disappointing to me that policy documents about higher education and writings by policy makers about higher education very rarely mention the people who work in universities as well as scouting academics, but also professional services, technical administrative staff. Um, surely they are key to the quality of what goes on in education. I'm really quite worried about the future of the career, particularly of academic, the academic career. We're producing a kind of precarity amongst early career academics. Um, there's a great deal of inequality in terms of gender and ethnicity within the profession. There are, there are professions, really, in, within academia, I think. Um, because of the different circumstances of different people. Do you have any comments, thoughts, reflections on you know, what we should be doing in terms of uh, working in higher education? Yeah, that's perfectly timed. My name's Helene Ward Creef, and I'm an assistant professor, but I'm actually based in America, and I've had all my training here. And I really had exactly the same questions as the gentleman just before. So who's actually providing this quality education that we've been talking about for the last couple of hours? And we think that's really critical to this whole piece of the puzzle. If we want people that are providing um, knowledge, which, as you mentioned, is at the frontiers of, of knowledge, well, really we need to, I think, support that a lot better. So many people I know have actually left higher education, they've gone into industry or many other different careers who are really dedicated to uh, wanting to do research and also wanting to teach, but just the, the foundation, the framework 
really hasn't supported that kind of um, career path. So just curious as to what the solutions were. Thank you, most of the great time called the Center for Education and International Development at uh, IRMCL. I've enjoyed uh, listening to uh, the book and uh, the topics. And Simon did say that higher education is uh, broader than UK, Scotland, Germany, Europe. So I wanted to ask a question in relation to other parts of the world. Um, interestingly, actually, the model of Oxford was exported to the Commonwealth countries that they suppressed universities for many years. Uh, they didn't want to expand universities until recently in Africa, for example. They didn't want the idea of universities expanding. But at the same time, the region has experienced the, you know, the fastest uh, expansion of university education, uh, although the cohort participation is still around 7 percent But I want to go to your quadrant, the four quadrants. In your historical analysis of the book, uh, do you think the economic benefits of higher education and then non-economic benefits can be realized simultaneously? Or is it the case that actually one comes before the other, especially if you look at the history of Europe's higher education uh, in that regard? Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I think, um, I, I don't really devote much of to this issue of, of the academic profession. Um, I, there's a lovely American called The Slow Professor, which I did, as it does, I think capture uh, is one of the best attempts at capturing what I do recognise is a very high levels of kind of unhappiness and frustration of the different social and academic profession. Um, I think one reason why I didn't feel able to say much about it was that I, I could only think of, of some fairly banal points to make. I mean, first of all, I do understand the argument that just compliance form-filling, scrutiny, um, the time that that takes is, uh, it has now become grossly excessive. Uh, that's sometimes the result of, a, it, it's partly the result of the, the consequence of government and public policy. There are too many different forms of data collection. And one of my views is an excellent priority for the OFS will be to try to do an exercise, which you know, the Association of University Administrators started in my time, which I strongly support and suggest, what are all the different data collection exercises going on in HE? Can we use our powers, the OFS, to have a serious go at just sorting out multiple reporting of similar but not identical data to lots of different people? So I think there is a massive kind of practical challenge there, which is the exact kind of thing the governments should do. Um, some of it, however, is also the wide responsibilities that now come with universities being the largest living institutions, and they need <coughs> policies on disability and complaints and how whistleblowers are treated, and that's an inevitable responsibility for any large organisation. But I, I think that's an issue. I think life for a postdoc is incredibly tough, and, the, and it's where the barriers to entry are uh, and uh, and indeed things which and again I discussed with Hecker but it's shocking in a way that it happened because I think it was only in the, the last ref for the first time there was a recognition of maternity in the requirement that four papers have to be submitted to the ref and the fact that you have to wait for the, to the 21st century for that to arrive just in ref is cool. so I think there are, there are things we could do should be done to try to improve the environment. But um, I didn't feel I had, I had um, a, a wide policy agenda in that, but I do I accept it's a the Then on the sort of the question about uh, these, first of all, Africa, I do briefly touch on Africa. Simon is right, he's not an attempt. I, don't, I can't claim it's a proper overview of what's happening globally, and now there is this extraordinary surge in our education. I do say I think that the way in which the West, when the West withdrew from Africa with decolonization, uh, partly perhaps because of the anxieties of the old colonial legacy, but one thing we completely failed to do was to support the universities we left behind in Africa. And that is a very strong grievance you pick up from South Africa. And of course that actually relate, I related to the early years doctrine, because 
uh, you know, all the Gordon Brown stuff is entirely about primary education. And of course, it's heroic that you're going to get um, all kids to school. If England had not had universities until we'd achieved 100% participation in primary education, the entire history of our country and our intellectual life would have been very different. Um, and we didn't, there was a nervousness, uh, including in, in key departments like Dick, which I think is finally getting better, but to support university education in developing countries. The view was we had to focus on primary education and literacy. Uh, as to whether, uh, but I don't see, it goes back to the previous question, I don't, I don't see the, the different types of, of uh, advantages, benefits in my quadrant. <laughs> as being the coming in an order, either a causal order or indeed a sort of merit order. Indeed, I want something which is sufficiently neutral that people who think it's an absolute outrage to refer to the fact that going to university boosts your, likely boosts your personal economic well-being, but I love the fact that you're more likely to vote and you're more tolerant. As well. I want them to feel comfortable with quadrants just like Confucius and his analytics wanted to focus on people earning the money. So they are designed to be as encompassing as possible. Uh, because I think we need something like that if we to be effective in making the case for our education. If you look at the early, way the early years effectively operated in the past 10 years, they have not sat around in having endlessly anguished debates amongst provided for early years as to whether they should draw attention to the fact that the kids are slightly happier, or they should draw attention to the fact that it boosts the earnings of their parents, especially their mother, who is more free to participate in the labor market. They don't have a massive internal ideological dispute. They just present a face to the wider world. Early years is a fantastic thing. So my quadrant was an attempt to have that type of approach. And I do think there's internal anguish in the university system about what kind of benefits are legitimate or illegitimate as weak in the overall case for education. I'm Ian McNay, I'm an emeritus professor in higher education and management at the University of Greenwich, but I'm wondering what Greenwich uh, in anything I'm about to say. Uh, I uh, arrived early and read the introduction to your book and I thought, oh, I'm agreeing with him, which is unusual. Um, he's recanted from certain things. Um, you talk about the inimical influence of Oxbridge, that straight line of only two universities and their suppression of other universities, and then bring that into the Russell group again and say that influence is still inimical. Um, my concern is then that you um, don't do anything about it. So that, for instance, if I pick up a couple of examples, um, Jonathan Adams said that the over-concentration of QR funding in a small number of universities was counterproductive now, it was not efficient. And what was the government response? They increased the concentration of QR funding in a smaller number of universities. You talk about then the influence of the inimical universities on schools and the driving down um, of the, um, what you call the arms race. And the, the main purpose of secondary schools now is to get people into university. Um, that, I think, uh, is a distortion of what I see as the purpose of secondary schools. But what you did then was say, oh, the criterion of a good school is how many people they get into, quote, elitist or posh universities, and simply reinforce that then. And the other thing then, and I'm with Peter on uh, the Scotland uh, issue, uh, the basic stats through uh, UCA, uh, sorry, through UCAS, I went through the first year of UCA, it's and left a, a lasting impression on me. Uh, UCAS, since between 2010 and 2016, mature student applicants in Scotland went up by 23%. In England, they went down by 26%. And you know Claire's work about the impact of fees on um, older students and part-time students. But that then reinforces your view that uh, the main role of university is to support the transition of the majority of people from adolescence to adulthood. It becomes a sort of finishing school. So I do have this problem then about the way that you are infantilizing universities by deeming that to be their role, that you are distorting the secondary schools 
by saying that their main purpose is to get people into universities, and preferably a small number of elitist universities, and the people I work with don't want to go to those elitist universities, they will not feel comfortable. My university has, I think, 53% of <coughs> working class students. I'm proud of that record. I work with the Open University and many people who are access uh, students. I've been involved in access since 1976. <coughs> so I'm concerned then that you come up with something, and some I agree with you very much, but you talk about then uh, an access premium. That was reduced by the government. So that, yes, I would love to see those universities who are committed to the social mobility agenda which was one of the tenets of the uh, coalition and now the Tory government. But you don't do that. You reinforce the elitist universities who are drawing from a class, returning that class position, and doing very little to help social mobility by supporting those who are committed to it. from Pearson College London. Um, I just had a question, and apologies if this is answered in the book, which I haven't read yet. Um, I think you had a view on the potential of degree apprenticeships to change the system. Um, because from my own perspective, they are a really game changer potentially, because for the first time, you have courses being offered in institutions in partnership with companies whose brand names can compete with the Russell Group. Uh, and if you do have a purely or even partly instrumental view of the purpose of your education as a young person. It's no longer the case now that your quickest and most efficient route to a company, say like L'Oreal or BBC, is through Oxbridge or a Russell route. It may be through an institution offering a degree apprenticeship, which will also have financial benefits as you go through. And if that then leads to a uh, drive on the part of the middle class, and you, you gave the stat before in terms of the correlation of institutions and class bases, it means that there is a drive there from the middle classes to institutions where historically they've not gone, whether or not that could genuinely shake things up. Hi, Young University, University of Cambridge. Um, a skeptic might be inclined to say that uh, higher education reflects the society rather than the other way around. So, one of the reasons why we think higher education is um, highly unequal, um, voluntaristic, as you yourself say, and um, prone to be Required privilege is because the British society is highly unequal, monopolistic, and reproducing required privilege. So I'm wondering how reasonable it is to expect universities to solve the problems of society they perhaps have contributed to but certainly not create. Well, the, um, the on the first question, uh, I'm not. My view is that we have a range of distinct missions. Um, I think it's, it's, it's good that we have got universities like the Russell Group focusing on research and, and research excellence can be measured. But I go out of my way in the book to try to get, um, especially the kind of general policy makers who may read it, to recognize that there is not a single rank, that doesn't lead to a single rank in good to bad. We've got a range of different missions. And the name, and I'm a believer in a broad, capacious definition of university which incorporates a range, uh, that range of missions. So I'm trying to make the case for the other missions as well. Um, and just in case when you said, I, I will, I came when you, when you said, you said, um, I was, I, one of the luxuries, it, it, up until July 2014, you, uh, David Willis, and you, the British government, were identical. For the last three years, uh, they would have slowly emerged from being part of HMG. Um, and so one thing that I argue, and I think I said this quite but one thing I did argue in my go about at the time is I certainly do not like the idea that you measure a school's performance by their chances of getting their students through into a Russell Group University. And I uh, argued that with him privately at the time, and I set out my objections to that in the book. Um, so I do think that there are, we should, uh, there are anything, the book makes people a little bit more relaxed and, and a little bit more uh, understanding of the range of different things that universities do and understand why Teesside and Coventry and Bournemouth and many others have distinctive and important roles in our education, that'd be a good thing. Um, on degree apprenticeships, uh, 
this believer in diversity of all kinds. He's great at getting to great apprenticeships. The, uh, I, in a liberal market economy, with a liberal labor market like England's, it is very hard to see how you have apprenticeships discharging the kind of role they have in the German because that depends on large numbers of jobs with license to practice, heavily, uh, much more heavily regulated labor. <coughs> it's no accident that the more liberal Anglo-Saxon economies tend to have relatively low rates of apprenticeship. They've seen the most particularly uh, striking growth in higher education participation. Uh, so I think higher, higher uh, degree apprenticeships are good, but I think there are there will be constraints. First of all, the money has to come from somewhere. And if employers are paying for this, just like out of public spending, it will constrain their growth. And you will find there are some employers for whom it does make sense, who think they're recruiting people for the long term in relatively stable industries for whom an apprenticeship makes sense. Uh, but that won't grow apprenticeships to anything like the scale of university participation. And secondly, and it's fascinating, you will see how this plays out, but the historic evidence on apprenticeships is that their long-term boost to earnings is significantly less than their long-term the long boost to earnings from higher education. So, um, you can, one of my worries is there's a hair of tortoise issue. Um, I suspect, rightly or wrongly, that the senior echelons of the BBC will be staffed by people who have had the breadth of the kind of university education I described. I do think university, university education does change people in ways that makes them, gives them the educational backgrounds that tends to prepare them for those sorts of jobs. That's why the evidence is that apprenticeships are not a route. The long-term growth of, of your wages if, you're, if you start as an apprentice is not as great as the long-term growth of your wages if you start in high education. So these programs will benefit, particularly if they bring people into higher education who would not otherwise have participated then there's a net gain. If there are some people who would otherwise have done a university course and instead do this route, we will only know in 10, 20, 30 years time if this worked out as a better bet for them or not. But so far, the evidence would suggest it's not going to be better. Um, and then on the, um, what was the third question? Can universities compensate for society? Oh yes, that's the But I was in that sorry, and I, I have to say, um, look, it's, but first of all, the obvious middle position is it's a two-way process. You are shaped and influenced by the rest of society. But if I may say so, significant universities, and certainly universities like Cambridge, itself has a role in shaping society. And one of the arguments that I used to have with uh, universities, including excellent universities like Cambridge, is that I thought Cambridge was too passive. It is not, if you compare the way in which Harvard recruits and the way in which Cambridge recruits, the Harvard philosophy is fundamentally different. The Cambridge model, which is the English model, is absolutely, we are trying to define the people who are absolutely at the top of academic achievement at the age of 18. And then we will recruit them into Oxford and Cambridge. When you talk to the people running with admissions at Harvard, they say people who go from Harvard will end up America's leaders. They're willing to say that in a way that Oxford and Cambridge are nervous about, though it's manifestly, historically, and accurate. Given that we at Harvard have a role in selecting America's lead, producing America's leaders, who we in turn recruit is incredibly important. And we will recruit people from a range of different attitudes, in, uh, and backgrounds, and a range of different attitudes. And I remember one person doing admissions at Harvard actually saying to me once, if we just recruited the people who came to us with the highest SATS marks, we'd end up producing middle-ranking programmers for IBM. They take their very conscious of ethnic background, social background, geographic background, and it's not to say they're perfect, because of course you can also buy a place at Harvard. They will also go to people whose father will help fund the library. And as I say in the book, part of the social contract which enables Harvard to have this completely different approach to recruitment is they can get away with taking a kid whose father is going to give $10 million to the library if they will also take a kid who underperformed at school but comes from a tough part of Chicago. It is a completely different model of how a university should function. And I wish our universities, in this respect, especially our most prestigious, I think they have a lot to learn from the way in which 
universities in the US. Well, I think that's our final question from the floor. Um, would you like the panel, would you like some uh, perhaps some questions? So, um, you know, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you for all, uh, to everyone for coming today and sharing our lunch and sharing uh, our discussion with David. Um, we can't always guarantee the same start quality every Thursday in our seminars, but we hope to see many of you again in our regular seminar program. I just wanted to say two things at the conclusion of what's been a really interesting discussion which could go on further, I think. <coughs> Firstly, we haven't talked much about a very important theme in David's talk, which is the, the, the inherent educability of everyone and the notion that um, we need more graduates rather than less or the same number. Um, this is becoming a very immediate political issue. I mean, we come back from summer, from the, sorry, from, that's my Australian's, <laughs> um, from the Christmas break, the short Christmas break, uh, to, to find a barrage of arguments about this in the tabloids. And I've been to a couple of meetings in the last week where I've talked about trends in global higher education, as I often do, and people have started talking about too many graduates. And that's been the main discussion in one of those meetings. You, you just get a sense that it's a rising, a rising theme. And I think it will be successful in slowing or halting growth for a time. Um, but David makes the argument really well, I think, for the extension of the role of higher education throughout the world. Um, it's a timeless argument. Uh, it will return, of course, in the UK. Growth will resume. If it stops, it will resume. Um, and it, I think it's, it speaks well to, to the, the liberalism and humanism and democratic temper of the book that this is such a core thing. But David's gone further than that. He's given us a package of policies which support it. Um, now, the combination of ICL, income contingent loans, and open and enrolment, uh, which he places great stress on rightly in the book, and if you add to that his proposal to bring back maintenance grants, those things between them give you both growth and a lot of box ticking in terms of social access. That's a pretty important policy framework and one which I think um, does need to be defended at this point of time. The other thing I wanted to say was that I thought Alex's question very early was absolutely the right question. What is a university education? Um, and the reason why I, 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 I like this book, you know, despite the inevitably reservations and criticisms which, which everyone will have when they read the book, because everyone's got different views about these things, um, is that it does go quite a long way towards addressing that question. Um, it is steeped in not just a nod towards, but an awareness, fundamental awareness of critical intellectualism, the importance of cognitive formation, a sense that that is really important, it's what we do and it's what we should do better, and everyone should have access, access to that, not just a small number of people. And the importance of knowledge content, and this is where it connects with what Paul said. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, what you get from the book is a sense of how important content and cognitive formation really are at the heart of the enterprise. Um, and, um, I mean, I think you could go further, David, in, in, along those lines. If you had another chapter to talk about the role of knowledge in, in learning, I um, mean, you could talk about how the formative effects of university um, take different forms and, and have different, uh, different flavour when we're talking about physicists or geneticists or engineers or financial experts or historians or psychologists or philosophers or, people, or librarians, you know, or people steeped in any number of different languages and cultural frameworks that they acquire at university. Because what we know from the research literature is that knowledge changes people. It changes what they can do, the way they think, their values, their capacity, their agency, their ability to change the world collectively and individually. Knowledge really matters, and the diversity of knowledge really matters, and it all contributes to the to the educated, com um, the educated conversation of society, which is the Kantian point, you know, about the importance of, of, of university education. Um, and um, 
You know, that's the answer to the question, I think, Alex. I mean, it's about, this is not well worded, but it's about the formation of people in terms of the educated attributes. So it's about, it's about geography. It's in here, centrally about geography. Um, and this is not a proxy for employability or for customer satisfaction, this knowledge role. Uh, and nor um, are, are cust consumer satisfaction and employability proxies for the, the formation of people in terms of the educated attributes. These are different things. And, I mean, philosophy students want jobs. Absolutely. But, but because they want jobs, it doesn't mean they love philosophy less. And I think that the message of David's book is that it's crazy to counterpose the practical business of life against the formative role of culture and knowledge. These two things are really important. Um, and, and, and I'd go further and say, I think what's really specific and important about higher education is the knowledge aspect. You can, uh, you can do a lot of the formation of people elsewhere in society, and we do, but what's particularly important about this enterprise is, is, this, is, is the steepening of people in complex knowledge. Uh, yeah, very quick final point to me. Um, thank you again, David, for his contribution. Thanks for a very good set of questions. It's been a great debate. Um, but for me, I sort of end where I began in my remarks with, I guess, a tribute really to, yeah, you have to remember this book has come out three and a half years or more after David stepped down as minister. And I think the, the, the weight, the substantial nature of his contribution is a testament to uh, the seriousness of his engagement. Uh, Right position and the, the reformist drive that he still brings to these debates. Uh, who knows whether we'll see a book from Joe Johnson three and a half years from now. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. Uh, but I think these debates need uh, David's voice. I very much hope he stays active and engaged uh, in them. Uh, I think the Conservative Party needs uh, uh, David's uh, voice on these debates. I think the centre right of British politics needs David's voice. And, uh, 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 particularly at a time like this when, as we've discussed, uh, we are uh, in, in somewhat choppy waters with respect to the wider political and cultural reception of, of, of the arguments in this book and the arguments that many of us hold here. Right. Well, I'd like to, to echo James' comments um, in terms of the calibre and the insights within this book. And can we all show our appreciation for the 